The shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill betide. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land. A weary land. A weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. Shame by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears of love, no fears of flight, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us meet. A shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our self retreat. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A weary land. A weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock divine, no oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. That's it. I'm sorry. And verse 5. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> page 613, page 613, 613, 613. I shall know him, page 613. morning I shall see. I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. Oh, the soul thrilling rapture of you his blessed face and the luster of his kind beaming high how my heart will praise him praise him for his mercy love and grace that prepared for me a mansion in the sky i shall know him i shall know him and redeemed by his side i shall stand I shall know him, I shall know him, by the print of the nails in his hand. I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, by the print of the nails in his hand. To the city in robe of spotless white, he will lead me where no tears shall ever flow. In the glad song of ages, hush, 
mingle with delight, and I long to meet my Savior first of all. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, by the print of the nails in His hand. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, by the print of the nails in His hand. Lord, we thank you for this night tonight. We thank you for another opportunity uh, to know you more. And Lord, we look forward to that day that we'll be able to see you face to face. And Lord, I pray that we would serve effectively until you come or until we uh, pass off into eternity. And Lord, that you would just motivate us tonight to do more for you. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. few announcements tonight that you, uh, I want to make you aware of. We have our love offering for uh, missionary Jarrett Montgomery to Puerto Rico. Uh, right after the service tonight, we're going to take up that special offering. And so if you were not able to give on Wednesday night, I challenge you to give to that. And uh, so we'll be doing that. Also, um, we have the Lord's Supper tonight, and we'll be observing that later on in the service. 16th and 17th is our Life Touch meeting. And uh, if you look at the back, if you don't know when your time is, we have the Thursday sheet underneath the Friday. Uh, so if you're confused and you don't know when you signed up, uh, just look there and we have both times uh, and you can double check on your time slot there. Also, uh, our Springing Forth Sunday School campaign is continuing on and uh, so you make sure you invite some people out and uh, so we can see uh, more people in our Sunday School and men, we really need to get going on that. Uh, we're losing horribly and so uh, uh, men bring some visitors. Uh, men's Advance, uh, that's going to be the 24th and 20th. 25th. The cost is $88, and uh, whenever you can get to that and paying that, uh, make sure you just designate that in an offering envelope, and uh, that will be good. Uh, also, we have our visitation 6.30 on Tuesday night. Door to door is going to be Saturday at 10 a.m. Uh, also, I want to make you aware of something. Uh, we have had uh, some people come in and do estimates uh, for our bathrooms, and it's exciting uh, that we're going to uh, be able to do that. Uh, but the thing is, as I said before, money is the issue. Right? Money is always uh, the thing. We've raised about $4,000 so far. Man, that is amazing. And uh, that's a miracle that we've uh, been able to raise that much. But just to do one bathroom will be estimated about $7,000. All right, and uh, as I said before, it may take a couple offerings. It may take a while. I thought it would take a couple years, but I don't know about you. I think we might be able to get it in uh, the next offering or so. So um, uh, you pray about how you can give, and uh, also if you do want to give to that, and uh, you want to designate that on your offering envelope, make sure you just put bathroom fund, and then you can uh, designate that on your envelope there and uh, continue to pay on that. And so that's where we are with that, and uh, we'll later on talk about it and discuss it. But just so you know, uh, you may be wondering, when are we going to get those bathrooms fixed? Uh, it will come uh, as money comes in, and so you pray uh, for wisdom with that as well. We have uh, the next song here is page 623, a new name written down in glory, 623. We'll stand together on this last song, I Was Once a Sinner. I was once a sinner, but I came, pardoned to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that he always kept his word. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine. And the white robe angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. For there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. 
With my sins forgiven, I'm bound for heaven, nevermore to roam. I was humbly kneeling at the cross, fearing not but God's angry frown. When the heavens opened, and I saw that my name was written down, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white robe angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I'm bound for heaven, nevermore to roam. At this time, shake hands with one another. Be sure and shake Ernestine's hand. She needs somebody to shake her hand. on that last verse now in the book is written say by grace oh the joy that came from my soul now I am forgiven and I know by the blood I am made whole there's a new name risen down in glory and it's mine oh yes it's mine with my soon no angel sing the story a sinner has come home, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine, with my sins forgiven I'm bound for heaven, nevermore to roam. Come to the time of our evening offering, and you give as unto the Lord. Brother Lonnie, if you would pray for our offering. pastor and his family just thank you for coming and sending them thank you for them uh willingly accepting what you have for them just amen. bless this church bless this offering up and meet the needs of this church and we'll give you all the praise in our name amen amen
tonight, turn to Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1. We'll be continuing on in our series of being complete in Christ. And so we're going to be looking at two verses tonight, verses 24 and 25 of Colossians chapter number 1. The Bible says this, "...who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for His body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister." according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you once again for this night. We thank you for the day that you've given us thus far, Lord, for speaking to hearts. Uh, Lord, I pray for those who still do not know you, that you have worked in their hearts even tonight. And Lord, that you would convict them and help them to see their need for you. But Lord, for those of us who are believers tonight, I pray that we would be motivated to serve you just as the Apostle Paul did and just as he challenges these people in Colossae. Uh, Lord, that uh, we would have a service that would be pleasing to you. Uh, Lord, that we would be disciples, uh, being willing to do whatever the cost in order to uh, know you more. Lord, I pray that we would understand that concept tonight. Well, thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, oftentimes when God wants to do an impossible task, He uses impossible things, doesn't He? I think of the uh, little boy's lunch, how that He fed over 5,000 people with just that little lunch. He used a whale to swallow up a man in order to get him to go the right direction once again. Uh, He used a wooden rod to split a body of water in two. Use that same rod in order to defeat a whole army of people. Uh, God used a talking donkey to reverse the doom of His people. He uses very unlikely things to do impossible tasks for Him. Someone once said, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. We see this evidence in 1 Corinthians 1.26. The Bible says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. See, tonight God delights in using small things for big tasks. God delights in using small people for big works. And you can see that God uses those who are weak, those who are base, because He wants to receive the glory at the end of the day. I wonder tonight, have you been serving the Lord? Do you sometimes feel inadequate for the job? I don't know about you, but sometimes I look at uh, the different things that I have in my life, uh, my description, if you would, my job description of uh, what God has called me to do, and then I look at the qualities that He's given to me, and I scratch my head and say, God, why would you put me in a position like this? Uh, Do you ever feel that way sometimes? Uh, Have you been putting off doing more for the Lord because of that? So tonight I want us to see three items of service to God that Paul points out to these people in Colossae. First of all, we see that it was a self-denying service. We see rejoicing and suffering. The Bible says in verse number 24 in the first part, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. In this verse, Paul is rejoicing. It's not because he had seen another Pentecost and it wasn't because he performed some great miracle. He was rejoicing because he had persecution coming his way. Uh, I want you to think about Philippians 3.10, how that Paul says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Uh, Rejoicing in the sufferings that were brought upon him. You say, why was he able to rejoice in these sufferings? The answer is because he knew as he served God, God would take care of him. Paul's outcome of his ministry did not bother him. What I mean by that is there was times where Paul would see many people saved. But there would be days where he would go and preach in the city. He would be thrown out and almost stoned to death. Uh, You can see that Paul, even when he would see all these people saved, or the next day go to the city and almost be thrown out, you can see that he did not lose his joy. He stayed faithful to the Lord. You know, I want to point out something tonight. There's a difference between joy and happiness. Is there not? Happiness is an emotion, 
right? Uh, we become happy when good things happen to us, obviously. Uh, you're not commanded to be happy when someone dies in the Bible, are you? Uh, could you imagine if somebody was happy when somebody died? Now, uh, you may have had that thought before, and that's horrible if you have. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we shouldn't be happy when someone dies. You're not going to go into the funeral home and uh, have upbeat music and, you know, everyone smiling and walking around. Uh, I actually read about something. They call them wakes, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but they have the actual person there, and they're almost like taxidermied or something. They're stuffed people, and they stand in the corner while while everyone's celebrating their death. Uh, that's pretty twisted. I don't know about you. Uh, I'm not happy when someone dies. But happiness is based on emotions. You're not going to be happy when someone dies. God doesn't expect us to be happy in a situation like that. But joy, on the other hand, is a state of being. Happiness can wear off real fast, can't it? Uh, when I was a kid, I can remember that my mom, she got a brand new mirror. She had wanted this mirror all of her life. Uh, and she's told me the story many a time, so I know how to tell it. Uh, but she wanted this mirror. And man, my dad, he finally went and got it for her. Uh, it stood about uh, yay tall uh, from here. And it would swivel back and forth. And she just wanted the thing for some reason. And so she got it. And my dad got major points. And man, uh, when mommy is happy, then everyone's happy. And so my dad was happy. I was happy. My uh, siblings were happy uh, because mom was happy. But that soon wore off. My brother and I, we were playing in my parents' bedroom. Why we were there in the first place, I don't know. That probably wasn't a good thing to be in there. But we were, and we were playing with blocks. I think we were playing dinosaurs or something, you know, uh, the imagination of a child. But uh, we were playing around, and we had those blocks. And I got this bright idea. I was going to take that block, and I was going to throw it at that brand new mirror and see really how great it was. Uh, I really don't know to this day why I did that. I remember why I got in trouble because I broke the mirror. Uh, uh, I remember that part. Uh, uh, but uh, let's just say I had seven years of bad luck. Uh, probably more than that. Uh, my mom's happiness that she once had soon wore off. Her emotions changed when the circumstances changed. Uh, that happiness turned into anger on me. Uh, <laughs> but joy in contrast we see that it is to be constant in the Christian's life. See, that's why the Bible says count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. It doesn't say count it all happiness when you fall into diverse temptations. Uh, uh, Paul fell into these diverse temptations. I'm here to tell you, Paul probably didn't that day when he was being persecuted say, I want to wake up today. Man, it's just a good day to get stoned to death. Uh, it's a good day to uh, have everyone have opposition against me and hate me and try to throw me out. Man, I'm ready to get up. I've ate my Wheaties this morning, if they had those back then, right? That wasn't his response. Uh, his response, no doubt, was uh, sadness that the people would not repent. But you could see that he did not lose his joy. His joy was different. Different. The reason he could rejoice in his sufferings was because he knew that his service was not about him. It was self-denial. It was all about Christ. If the people got saved and the whole city turned to Christ, then that would be great. But if they didn't, if he had persecution come his way, it didn't matter. Because his service wasn't about him. The outcome wasn't about him. It was all about Jesus Christ. If persecution came, he knew that he was doing it for Christ. If prosperity came, he knew that it was for Christ. He was ready to do that. His service was selfless. It was all about the Savior. But I want you to see also here the perspective of Paul. Look at verse 24. The Bible continues on and says, And fill up that which is behind the afflictions of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. The way that Paul viewed his service and the suffering that went with it was that he compared his suffering to the cross of Christ. And with this, what Paul is saying, his dedication could never match or surpass what Christ did for him. Albert Barnes uh, said this of the text. He said that he, Paul, had not yet suffered as much as Christ did in this cause. And though he, uh, though he had suffered greatly, yet there was much that was lacking to him 
uh, to make him equal in respect to the Savior. This phrase here where it says, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, what that is saying is, is that he could never match up to what Christ did for him. He would always be behind if you were taking tallies of what Christ has done for us and what Paul has done for Christ. Paul would always be behind in the game because Christ always did more for him. And you know what? That's how it is. The more we serve Christ, He's still going to be ahead of the game, right? Uh, He's still going to have more greatness and more uh, displays than we are. But we should continually serve Him. You could see that His perspective was, since Christ died for me, no sacrifice is too great for Him. And you can see that through this, He was trying to do uh, all that He could to please the Lord. With this service, we see that he suffered on behalf of the church. He talks about this. He said he did it for the body's sake. What was going on at this point in time was Paul was very different than many of the preachers that day. He was different from the priest of that day. Because Paul would preach not only to Jews, but he would preach to Gentiles. Not only did he preach to both Jew and Gentile, but he was breaking the barrier at that point in time as well. Uh, You know that uh, the church of Antioch, I believe, they had uh, believers that were Jew and Gentile. And the church at Jerusalem, man, they got all upset about that. But you could see that that was a thriving church. Because of Paul going and preaching not only to the Jews but to the Gentiles, he endured persecution because of that. That's what he is speaking of. He is saying, even for your church... I have been persecuted for it. Uh, For the church at Rome, the church of uh, uh, these different places, he was being persecuted as a result of this. That's why in Romans 1.16 he said, For I am not ashamed of of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Service to him was all about pleasing God. That was his perspective in life. Selfish service is impressed with the big deal. True service finds it almost impossible to distinguish the small from the large. Selfish service requires external rewards. True service rests contented in hiddenness. Selfish service is highly concerned about results. True service is free of the need to calculate results. Selfish service picks and chooses whom to serve. True service is indiscriminate in its ministry. Selfish service is affected by moods and whims. True service ministers simply and purely. I think of the greatest example of all the greatest servant of all, Jesus Christ. Mark 10, 44 and 45 says this, And whosoever of you will be chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. Catch it tonight, don't miss it. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, did not come so people would bow down to Him. He came to minister. If Christ came for the purpose of ministering, the King of Kings stooped down to wash His disciples' feet, to sit with the publicans and sinners, how much more should we, as those who are saved under His ministry, be humble in our service? You know, sometimes we can get a big head spiritually. We can say, well, I know things about this doctrine. And man, I know more about the Bible than this person. And uh, man, I've been to church this long. And so because I have all these different qualities about me, and since I have this certain job, and I have more toys than this person, it's almost like going back to first grade. Uh, We compare ourselves and we say, well, I have this and I have that. Uh, We get to a point where we think, if you don't bow down to me, and you don't serve me, and you don't do, do what I tell me, then off with your head. It shouldn't be that way. The way we should be is a servant. Philippians 2 uh, verses uh, 5 through 8, I believe it is, it says that Christ took upon Him the form of a servant. I'm told that that word servant there literally means a doormat. Is a doormat going to proclaim and say, look how great I am. A man, look uh, what I do. Uh, People come and they wipe their dirt all over me. (laughs) Uh, they don't have a whole lot to glory of, do they? That's how we should be. We should be doormats. We are used. I think of Paul, how he said, uh, the more I love, the less I be loved. 
That's true service to God. You're going to invest in people and you're going to serve and you're going to try to do more. People aren't going to like you for it. They're going to despise you at times. But we continue to love. We continue to serve because that's what Christ did. Man, He came into His own. His own received Him not. Uh, You can see that Christ, no matter what, He continued on. People treated Him like a doormat, but He still served anyway. He ministered. How much more as we as believers should serve the Lord to have a correct perspective of service tonight. A selfless servant. But I want you to see secondly here tonight, it is a time to serve. Verse number 25, the Bible says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God. Uh, And we see here that Paul says that he's a minister of the dispensation. This word dispensation is interesting. It refers to uh, commandments that have been revealed by God, and it is according to His master plan. Maybe you've heard of something called dispensationalism. Uh, Let me explain kind of what that is. I kind of have to try to do it in a nutshell, but it's a very broad study. Uh, But uh, we see that God created the garden. Everything in it was good. As He said, the last thing He created was man. Man fell. The dispensation at that point in time would be that God would institute that a Messiah would come and die for them. That was the dispensation. Uh, God knew that man would fall, but He had that plan exactly in mind when they would do it. That's the dispensation. Uh, After a while, man became exceedingly wicked, and the dispensation that occurred as a result of that was the flood. Right? Right? Uh, Because uh, God had that in His master plan. Uh, The Tower of Babel, uh, confusion of languages, would uh, be as a result of that. And so you can kind of see what a dispensation is. Uh, We can see uh, how that God instituted this plan, this dispensation, when certain events took place. Dispensations are God's master plans that were set in place as a result of the response of the people. And so Paul tells us here that it was according to God's commandment. It was according to God's master plan that he would preach the gospel to the Gentiles at that point in time. He recognized that God placed him at that point in time to preach the gospel and that he was to serve. It was a time for service. You know, I think of Esther. This perfectly illustrates this. You remember how that the king was looking for a woman to take as his own and there Esther was among all these other beautiful women and uh, he takes Esther and he decides that he'll uh, uh, take her as his bride and Esther, one thing he did not know about her was she was a Jew, right? Mordecai said, do not tell her, do not let her know. Uh, I don't know how the nose wouldn't give it away but uh, you know he somehow didn't know that she was a Jew and so uh, he said well I want this woman and so uh, he took her and uh, you know they uh, were able to be happy for a while but then old Haman came and uh, he started to say well we need to annihilate these Jews. Well, Esther, as she heard this man, she became very concerned and uh, she didn't want the death of her people. She was in the very palace. She had the very heart of the king. Mordecai says to her, he says, Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? See, God placed Esther at that point in time for a specific reason. God no doubt touched the heart of the king to choose her for such a time as that. Esther's response to this was, if I perish, I perish. You know, she was willing to serve God at that point in time. If it meant death, then she would die. But she wanted to spare her people. What if she would have just sat back and said, well, uh, you guys, you'll all die. I'll be okay because he doesn't know I'm a Jew. People wouldn't be spared, right? They would all be destroyed. But because one woman stood up and she decided that she would uh, stand up for her people, stand up for the cause of Christ, you can see that many were saved as a result. Today, they even celebrate a holiday called Purim. Remembering how that uh, Esther saved the people and went before the king. May I say today it is time to serve the Lord We see that Paul was commanded to serve the Lord. He understood the master plan of uh, God for uh, God's will for his life, and he continued in it. God has a master plan for your life tonight. But will you serve? Will you do what he has called you to do? Tonight is the night to serve. Uh, Tomorrow is the day to serve. Every day we should serve the Lord. 
But I want you to see there's a reason to serve as well. Look at the last part of verse 25. The Bible says this, <clears throat> to fulfill the word of God. Paul gives us one reason of many why we should serve the Lord. Simply to obey His commandments. We are to obey what is contained in the Word of God. Ezra 7.10, the Bible says this, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. He sought the law of God, but I want you to notice here, he didn't just seek the Word of God, he did it as well. Uh, he didn't just continually take in knowledge and do nothing with it. He took what he learned and he performed it in an act of obedience to God. You know, there are those who I would call anorexic Christians tonight. Those who spiritually are anorexic. I mean, those who never feast on the Word of God. Those who never embark a church door. Those uh, who uh, have backslidden from God. And as a result, they have been famished spiritually. But there are those also that I would like to call obese Christians, spiritually. Those who take in the Word of God. And those who come to church, those who do Bible study, those who look at the hot topics and they uh, research it and they look in their Bible, and that's all fine and great, but they never exercise what they learn. See, they have a knowledge of the Word of God and they look in it continually, but they never do anything with what they learn. You know, the Bible says that all knowledge does is puff up. God didn't intend His Word just to be read. He intended it to be exercised as well. Uh, you, if you know every single street in this town or every street in Wichita, and man, you have the whole map of Kansas memorized, and you never go out and drive one single day of your life, what good is that knowledge going to do you? I mean, honestly, uh, you're like, seriously, you know the whole map of Kansas. Anyway, uh, that would be kind of difficult, uh, I guess. Uh, not as difficult as some states. Uh, but it would be pointless to have that knowledge if you never do anything with it. Same is true with the Word of God. You may know all the Scriptures. You may know all the major doctrines. You may know all the Bible stories. But do you exercise what He tells you to do? When you're convicted, do you just take that and tuck it in the back of your mind? Or do you serve? Do you do what you're supposed to? See, God wants us to fulfill His commandments. He wants us to obey. Did you realize that when you obey the Word of God, you are serving God? It's an amazing concept. See, you may not be able to get out and knock on doors. You may not be able to teach a Sunday school class. You may not be able to sing in the choir. And uh, some people, thank the Lord, you don't, right? Uh, just like me. And uh, you may not be able to do these things, but through obeying God's Word, what you're doing is you're serving Him. Uh, through doing what He is telling you to do, you're showing that worship, you're showing that adoration towards Him. I wonder, have you been serving God? Through obeying His Word. God said to Saul, it is better to obey than to sacrifice. God wants your obedience tonight. He wants you to obey His Word. And with that, your service will be pleasing to Him. Hudson Taylor, a famous missionary, was once scheduled to preach at a church in Melbourne, Australia. The moderator of the service got up and he started to introduce him. And man, uh, he was waxing eloquent about him. And he told the congregation what all the things Taylor had accomplished in China... Then he presented him as our illustrious guest. Taylor stood quietly for a moment. He opened his message by saying this, Dear friends, I am the little servant of an illustrious master. A man who did many great things, a man who even started a mission board, you can see how that this man was able to stand before the people and say, I'm a little servant, serving an illustrious master. You know, Paul no doubt would say the same thing. He'd say, it's not me, it's him. You know, tonight service is not about us. It's about denying self. It's about serving in this time. But it's also about obeying his word. God wants you to obey, and through obeying you serve. And when you serve, you do it not in your own power, but you do it in the power of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this night tonight. We thank You for this opportunity to look into Your Word and see the example of Paul. Lord, I pray that You would just speak to our hearts about serving You. 
God, would we be more motivated to do more for you? Uh, Would we understand that we should have selfless service and not selfish service? May it all be about you. Well, thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we have the piano play, heads bowed and eyes closed. If the Lord's spoken to your heart, I challenge you to come. Uh, Maybe at this time you need to get things right in regards to the Lord's table. Uh, It's very specific that uh, we need to make sure our heart is completely right with the Lord. And so maybe at this time you need to uh, just examine yourself and make sure, say, God, uh, if there be any wicked way in me, let me know. Search my heart as the piano plays. If our deacons could come forward as we administer the ordinance of the Lord. In our church, we take a closed communion position. And uh, what that simply means is we open it up to the members of our church. And uh, we do that for several reasons. Uh, But uh, if you're here today visiting, uh, we love that you're visiting us. But uh, just uh, so you know, we observe it as a church uh, family. And so that's how we'll do that tonight. Uh, At this time, we'll read in 1 Corinthians 11, if you want to open up to that passage. We'll be looking, starting in verse 23, 1 Corinthians 11, 23. The Bible says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread. When He had given thanks, He brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me." After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Brother Lonnie, would you pray as we administer uh, the bread, the body that was broken uh, on that cross that day? Allowing your body to be broken like it was. Help us to remember what you did for us. Help mm-hmm. us to uh, just remember everything that you do. And, and uh, as we walk with you, we walk closer to you. Just uh, thank you for allowing that. Uh, 
it could be an easy decision. We make we make it hard. Mm -hmm. He did the hard part for us. He should do the easy part. Just forgive us for where we fail you, and we'll give you all the praise. Now in your name. Amen. Jesus said, uh, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do ye in remembrance of me. Take eat of it. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, Brother Lyle, would you pray uh, as we observe the blood that was shed for us on that cross? Father, we thank you that you uh, found the blood of your Son acceptable, Lord, that the power that it had to cleanse sin, and Father, we just thank you uh, for that. We thank you for your Son that was willing, who was obedient to, the, to uh, the cross, even to the death, and Father, to shed his blood that it might be sprinkled in the mercy seat for us. Father, we just thank you for this, and Lord, help us to remember this daily as we mm -hmm. walk as, uh, as Christians. All you did for us, so let's pray in Jesus' name. 